My name's Donald Trump, and I'm the largest real estate developer in New York. I own buildings all over the place. I used my brain. I used my negotiating skills, and I worked it all out. Now my company's bigger than it ever was. It's stronger than it ever was, and I'm having more fun than I ever had. Brains, negotiating skills, and as his recent civil fraud trial revealed, a lot of creative accounting. That was Donald Trump in the pilot episode of The Apprentice, bragging about being a self-made business star. According to a brand new book, Apprentice in Wonderland, by one of our next guests, Ramin Sedute. Uh, that image of a self-made businessman was all smoke and mirrors from the start. It was a vehicle to help Trump get what he craves most, attention. Now, the book was written, it was done through six interviews, and Trump has been interviewed for this book more than at any other, by, than anyone else since his post-presidency. And, and the book says this, on the set of The Apprentice, Trump was notable not as a brilliant business mind, but as an insecure actor. He sulked when he wasn't the center of attention. He leered at attractive women. He hijacked the production with his own ego and inability to read a teleprompter. He didn't take direction, and he surrounded himself with a team tasked with making him look good. He wasn't interested in reading briefs about what had happened that day. Instead, he was purely focused on maximizing his screen time. It was in the hunt for audience attention that Trump discovered the formula that would take him to the White House. It became clear in our first post-presidency meeting that there is no way to reasonably interview Trump as a politician. He's not a politician. There's no way to ask him about governing. He's not able to govern. There's no point in trying to pin him down on his hopes for another term. He doesn't care about the specifics of the plot during his time in the White House. He just wants to get renewed for another season. Wow. Joining our conversation, co-editor-in-chief of Variety, author of the new book, Apprentice in Wonderland, How Donald Trump and Mark Burnett Took America Through the Looking Glass. Ramin Satude is here with us. Also joining us, host of the On Brand podcast, Donnie Deutsch is here. Ramin, congratulations. I, I've followed your interviews. I'm reading the book. It is the most important analysis and set of interviews with Trump that we have to work with. And I just want you to say more about the interviews with him. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I went about uh, reporting this book since 2021. Um, I spent a lot of time with Donald Trump. We sat down together um, over the years. We did six interviews total. We spent time in Trump Tower. I went to Mar-a-Lago and visited him. And in the first interview I did with him, this was in May 2021, he was in Trump Tower. He was a deflated man. He was very unhappy about the fact that he was no longer in the White House. And as we started talking about The Apprentice, because this book is about the skeleton key that made Donald Trump, the mirage that was created by Mark Burnett, this image that was projected on millions of American people that Donald Trump was a smart, strong, thoughtful business leader. And as we were talking, this was during um, the early still days of COVID, and Donald Trump was celebrating over the fact that in India, people were dying and they were suffering. And he was happy over the fact that India finally was catching up to the United States and that people criticized him as president for not doing enough during COVID. And now that people were dying in India, he felt better because their numbers were now bad and our numbers were not as bad. And it was proof to him that he'd done a good job during COVID. And that was a very alarming moment in our interview. And there are so many like that during our conversations. This book really peels back the curtain on who Donald Trump is, his state of mind and what he's thinking and what he wants to do if he returns to the White House. Ramin, um, he, he slips. You talk about it sort of as a mask coming off moment and tells you that he lost. He does. In one of our conversations, we were watching actually clips of The Apprentice, and I showed him a clip of Geraldo Rivera, who was a contestant in one of the seasons of The Celebrity Apprentice, and he got very worked up over their falling out and the feud that they had. And he said, when I lost the election, and that was a really revealing moment to me, and it proved something that I'd been thinking about in our conversations, and which is Donald Trump is playing a character. He's a reality show character that projects this image that people want to see. And I think, truthfully, if we really, really were able to get inside his head and find the truth, he would admit that he lost the election because he said it to me. You also track 
during your six conversations, um, some interesting things about his ability to recall mm -hmm. talking to you those six times. Tell us about that. So between our first and second conversation, which was only months apart, he had spent a significant time with me um, in Trump Tower that first day. He really had a great time. Uh, he told Jason Miller, um, one of his advisors who was in the meeting, how much he appreciated talking to me, how happy it made him to talk about The Apprentice. And then when I returned to his office, he had no recollection of our conversation at all. He had a blank expression on his face. He seemed confused. Um, and we started the conversation really from square one. And he told me the same stories over again. He couldn't remember what he had said, what he had not said. But more broadly, it was interesting because I think he remembered things that happened 20 years ago a lot more clearly than he remembers things that happened more recently. He's very confused by the chronology of events, and his time in the White House was actually blurry. One thing that he couldn't remember was the day NBC called him and told him that he would never again host The Apprentice. This was in the early days of the campaign when he made disparaging comments about immigrants from Mexico and racist comments on the campaign trail, and NBC finally separated themselves from him, and he had no memory of that. He said, well, it's all about ratings. You can be the worst person in the world. You can still get ratings. So he thought in his head that he could go back on TV. He also thought the reason NBC covers him so critically is that they're very upset that he's no longer host of The Apprentice. You described Trump Tower as Grey Gardens without the cats. Um, that also is a, a myth busted. Say more. There was a quality about being with Donald Trump where it felt like, um, as the editor-in-chief of Variety, I spent a lot of time interviewing actors, and it felt like an actor who had no longer been getting roles, who had no longer been getting cast or getting calls. And this was shortly after he left the White House. Um, there was uh, issues of Trump magazine, a publication that no longer comes out. Um, there were questions, there were, there was a, not very many people around him. He had questions, a lot of questions about who was loyal, who was not loyal, but he was looking back. There was no forward momentum in the person of Donald Trump. There was no reflection mm. about the incredible power he had as president and the incredible legacy that one would have as president of the United States. It was all about vendettas, feuds, and how people wronged him. One of the places where I think people in, our, in my line of work have fallen down is the assault on voting rights. Historically, it's been predicated on all sorts of, of, of ugly things. In the last four years, it's been predicated on a lie, something Bill Barr calls bullshit, just to quote Bill Barr. How do you assess the progress they made in voter suppression legislation enacted at the state le at state level, even uh, by Republicans who push back. I mean, in, in Georgia, um, a voter suppression law so odious to Major League Baseball that they moved the All Star Game to another state, and and now people sort of just shrug, and it's 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 what had to be, even though even though the Georgia Republican official, Secretary of State and Governor, said there was no fraud there. How do we one do a better job, and two stop that erosion of of voting rights? Yeah, I mean, that one, that's a genie that in some ways is out of the bottle and is going to be hard to get back, at least that first part. You know, there is this feeling, uh, it is totally unfounded that there is widespread um, voter fraud. Forget about even the 2020 election and whether or not that was stolen. There is this fear that somehow, some way, substantial numbers of people who shouldn't have the ability to vote are in fact voting, that voting is count, miscounted uh, in, in a way that favors one party or, or the other. That's got to be pushed back again with statistical evidence, uh, with public officials who are willing to stand up and say that, in fact, is not true. You know, the Brennan Center has done great work in, in that regard. And again, these are things that are not necessarily as attractive as the lies are, but it means that there has to be discipline on the side of those people who are standing for democracy and then pushing it out there again and again and again and reassuring the American people that our system works well in the way in which um, it is presently constituted. Um, we, at the, ND, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee that, that I head up, you know, we got 5,000 poll workers for, um, recruited 5,000 poll workers for the 2000, for the 2020 election. And we're going to try to double that for the election in 2024, all in an attempt to get Republicans, Democrats, independents, conservatives, progressives uh, engaged in our, our civic system. And so, uh, you know, it's going to take examples like that, efforts like that, um, message discipline in, in the way that I have described. It's going to be hard, but I, I think it can ultimately um, be done. And again, that fear notion, 
if you don't vote, mm -hmm. if you don't trust in the system, um, you are leading this nation down an authoritarian path from which we might never recover. That has to be a component of, uh, of the message. What do you make of the sort of silence uh, among the business community? Uh, we've been trying to cover this, this question of autocracy in America, the idea that it could happen here. Six months ago, it seemed sort of far-fetched. Now every, everyone is, it seems kind of keyed into the, the possibility. I mean, people like yourself who, who watch it closely at a policy level and, and know all of the metrics and, and what's ticking up, um, un understood it at an intuitive level. But, but even amid the public who, who are consuming news understand it is a very real threat and it's what Trump's running on. But, but what do you make of the silence in the business community, their indifference to America turning into something um, that more closely resembles Orban's Hungary? Yeah, it's interesting because I think they're, the business community, I, I see in, in two ways. One, there are those who think that the election of Trump is going to do something positive for them um, financially, either personally, financially, or their, um, their, their companies are going to benefit from uh, you know, a, a Trump presidency. All right, that's that's one. There's another part of the business community, and I think it's probably the majority, um, who don't want to get involved in political things at all, and they stay silent. Um, they don't understand necessarily the power that they have and that I think should be used in defense of democracy, and also don't understand that, you know, if you give Trump this power, he then has the ability to pick winners and losers in the economic mm -hmm. sphere. And he'll decide, or his Justice Department will decide, you know, who gets prosecuted for what kinds of crimes, what mergers go through, what mergers are opposed by the antitrust division. Um, you know, the rule of law and the neutrality of the Justice Department is something that ought to matter to the, um, to the business community. Again, there are going to be those who are going to make a, a real bargain with the devil with the hope that, or with the thought that they're going to, they're going to do better economically. And um, that's, a, that's a hell of a price, to, a hell of a price to pay um, for our democracy, you know, to put your economic advantage uh, above that which has defined this nation um, at its best. It's just an amazing failure of imagination. I mean, we've now, we know Trump. We've watched him. Some CEO's daughter could tweet an unflattering picture of Trump. He could decide to sabotage a company's stock price. It just feels like on year nine, um, this is an important part of the country that shouldn't stay silent. I, I want to ask you about the Supreme Court, and I want to ask you how you're thinking about this period where we are waiting for the extraordinary, for, for something that people told us we wouldn't have to worry about. We're waiting for the Supreme Court's opinion on immunity. And Trump has actually actually argued before the Supreme Court and based on the questioning has some receptive audience members to the idea that a president should be immune from prosecution. What, how are you thinking about this period and do you have any predictions? Well, I got to tell you this. I mean, anything less than a decision by the Supreme Court that says a, a president should be held to the laws just like any other American citizen should be, anything other than that is absurd. The notion, for instance, that apparently some justices are, are fooling around with it. Well, if the president violated the criminal law but was doing so in his official capacity, there may be some basis to say that that's okay. We need to step back and, and think about that. Um, you know, wait a minute. A president can violate the American criminal law if he or she is doing something in their official capacity. That is an absurd and dangerous um, conclusion. And I'm worried, given the length of time that it has taken for the Supreme Court to decide this case, that something along those lines might come out of the um, Supreme Court. You know, the, the, the federal appellate court gave that argument short shrift and wrote, I think, a very compelling opinion. It's hard for me to understand why the court even took this case. I'm worried when Justice Kavanaugh says things like, we have to write for the ages. No, you don't. You need to decide the case just in front of you on the basis of the facts and the law that has been presented to you. And if that, if you do that, you will reach the same conclusion as the appellate court, that a president needs to be held accountable in the same way that any other American um, would be. Any result other than that is, uh, is I think, both absurd um, and extremely, extremely dangerous. There might be only one thing more alarming than what has become a near medieval siege on our country's tradition of respect for the rule of law. And it's the fact that many Americans, regrettably but understandably, have, after all these years of Trump and his allies attacking it, grown numb to it or view it as a new norm. Maybe it's an act of self-preservation for some. Maybe it's easier to just tune it all out. 
when Trump or one of his allies in Congress or a voice on conservative media spits out such venom toward the men and women of DOJ or the FBI. But the temptation to register the lies being told about the justice system, about the FBI, simply as white noise or politics as usual, in our view, represents as grave a threat to democracy as the lies being told themselves. As an example, consider what the disgraced convicted ex-president told the crowd in Racine, Wisconsin on Tuesday. The outrageous charges in New York were a corrupt creation of crooked Joe Biden and his group. And they really weaponized what they did is they weaponized the Department of Justice. They weaponized all the White House. No, they didn't. <laughs> Trump committed a crime, and the people who helped him do so, some of them went to jail, some of them received immunity. They testified, and a jury of his peers convicted him. He was held accountable by a local prosecutor who worked completely independently of the Department of Justice. Full stop. But were you or I might just dismiss this as a campaign speech, MAGA disinfo, riling up the base, as just that? Trump's supporters hear those words, accept them as fact, and with January 6th as an example, are open to acting violently. It's how Trump and his allies are today priming Trump supporters for what will be nothing less than a hostile takeover of the Department of Justice should Trump prevail in November, turning around the very instruments used to keep Trump in check into political weapons. And don't take our word for it. They're saying it out loud. Trump ally, fellow convict Steve Bannon, has been open about the plan to prosecute high-ranking DOJ officials, people like Attorney General Merrick Garland, out of what he describes as, quote, retribution. Of course, when it comes to unfounded attacks against the people serving at the top of the Department of Justice, Steve Bannon's warmongering is more like Chapter 10 in a years-long saga on this front. One could easily argue that chapter one started during the Obama presidency. If you've never heard or you forgot what Fast and Furious is outside of the context of a major motion picture franchise, then you successfully avoided or forgot about that period in American history. To jog your memory, Operation Fast and Furious was an ill-fated gun tracing program related to dangerous Mexican drug cartels. The operation went wrong when a U.S. Border Patrol agent was tragically killed. Two guns from the operation were found at the scene. Attorney General at the time, Eric Holder, provided lawmakers with thousands of pages of documents, only to become the first ever sitting cabinet official in our country's history to ever be held in contempt of Congress. Then, a 19-month DOJ IG investigation found zero evidence that A.G. Holder or any of DOJ's top leaders knew of or sought to cover up the depth of the scandal. But the, the damage had been done. The train had left the station, as they say. A concerted breakdown of trust between conservatives, right-wing media, and our institutions, especially the Department of Justice, was set in motion. The end result, all these years later, a convicted felon, presumptive Republican Party nominee, running openly on going to war with the Department of Justice on day one if he prevails in November. It is through this wider lens, this longer view of modern political history, that we examine Trump's near daily and escalating attacks on the rule of law with our next guest. Joining our conversation, former Attorney General Eric Holder is here. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Thanks for having me, Nicole. I uh, didn't want to necessarily review Fast and Furious, but that's uh, that's probably a good place to start this conversation. Well, and, and I went I went back and read about it myself. I, I was, I've never said this on TV, but I first read in when I had written a novel and, and Chris Wallace was a friend of mine. He invited me to come on the program as a panelist to mention the book. And he said, we're talking about Fast and Furious. And I said, what's that? He said, oh, read in. Our audience is really... Um, fired up about it. And I, I remember Googling and reading it. And, and it's as good an example as any of, of the injection of politics, pulling the levers of congressional allies to do something that had never been done before, and then softening the terrain with conservative media and conservative activists. And I, and I wonder what you make of what Trump's promising to do in a second term to the department that you once led. 
Yeah, to a department that I once led and that I love dearly. I spent nearly 20 years of my career at the Justice Department, starting off as just a line lawyer uh, in the Justice Department, coming out straight out of law school. And there's a tradition in the department that uh, regardless of who is in charge politically, uh, the department uses its power uh, in an apolitical way. And I'm very concerned about what uh, the former president says he's going to do. Steve Bannon says he what he's going to do. And I take them at their word. Uh, and I think they've learned from the first term. They will appoint a compliant attorney general. But beyond that, they now understand that they will have a compliant deputy attorney general. They will have compliant United States attorneys. And they will give these compliant U.S. attorneys um, hiring power so they can appoint a compliant assistant United States attorneys. And they will do the things that they have said that they're going to do open investigations against political opponents, uh, use the law in ways that is inconsistent with the neutral, neutral way in which uh, the Justice Department is supposed to operate. Uh, this is something that should be, I think, a prime campaign issue. We're talking about the rule of law in this country, which really serves as the basis, the foundation for all that we hold near and dear um, in America. It is the area where Trump's current advisors have spent the most time and energy on the architecture of dismantling and reassembling as a political weapon. And one of the things I know from my time in government is that other than the military, the people, people like yourself who've served in the Department of Justice have zero appetite for politics. And I agree with you, this should be a, a front, a first, second, third issue for the voters. But how do you sort of bridge that gap between a department where the, the very essence of pushing back against Trumpism is to not be political, but the most, the most effective way to reject what Trump wants to do to the department is a political solution of, of not voting for him. How do you bridge that, that gap? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think there necessarily is a gap. I mean, to say that you know you're for a neutral Justice Department, that you are for a democracy, that you are for the rule of law, um, those to me seem to be you know apolitical things that can be injected into the political sphere. To say, well, you know, we have one candidate who will stand for those non-political, apolitical, um, pro-democracy measures, and we have on the other side a candidate who is bound and determined to subvert the system to his will, subvert the system so that his supporters and himself as well um, are not subject to the rules in the way that other American citizens are. Um, you know, I, I think that you know people who oppose uh, the, the former president have got to really kind of get over it. Um, and understand the, mm. the battle on which we are now operating, the terrain on which we are now operating. The normal rules in a lot of ways simply don't apply. And it means that we're going to have to be more upfront. We're going to have to be more forceful. Um, doesn't mean that we have to, you know, duplicate that which they say they're going to do or use the tactics that they're going to use. But um, I, I think being just, as I said, more forceful, um, more open about what the dangers are, um, you know, fear is a big motivator. In 2008, Barack Obama used hope and change as a thing that galvanized huge numbers of people. Um, I, I think that fear used appropriately is something that can be uh, employed here because the fear is of losing our democracy. The fear is of losing our freedoms. The fear is losing our ability, um, women's ability to make reproductive um, decisions. That's a fear that I think should be legitimately used by those who oppose uh, the former president. He's certainly using fear, um, you know, illegitimate um, fears to try to galvanize uh, his supporters. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I think that is the frame around which the, the campaign must be waged, right? I mean, we can, we can and I, I think Liz Cheney articulates this, we can go back to having policy fights after, after the threat of Trump and the fear of what he'd do to our democracy has abated. I wonder where you where you would sort of put all of the revelations. I mean, the, the thing that is different this time around, we were so dependent on investigative journalists in 16 to break stories about Trump's trespasses and norm busting. It's now all on a website. I mean, it's, it's all spilling out of his mouth somewhat incoherently. How, how, do you, how do you break through to people who aren't paying attention or look at it as, wow, both sides do it. You know, how, how do you sort of jolt people into understanding the threat that he poses to our democracy? 
Well, you know, I, I think that we have to use tangible examples. And it means that if it doesn't break through the first time you say it, or the second time, or the third time, you say it a fourth time. Um, and, and tangible examples, and make people in, in the most digestible way possible familiar with what the charges are in the pending cases, make people familiar with what the results were of the, the case that was ultimately tried um, in New York City. When it comes to you know reproductive rights, as you've done on, on this show, I think very compellingly, ha have women come on and tell their stories. Um, have people come on and talk about how it's more difficult to vote in certain parts of, of the country. You know, yeah. again, having real people talk about how the, the things that they have done and will do uh, will have an impact on, on their lives. Contextualize this in a way um, that makes it real for the American voter.